Okay, let's do it. So this is session two in the Northern Digital Storytelling Festival 2023. And I'm really excited. Um, this has been a long time in the making. We started planning this pre-Christmas. Um, so we've, we have 58 speaker sessions over um, a 12 day period. Uh, this is our second session um, with, with three fantastic speakers I'm really looking forward to hearing from. So welcome everyone. Welcome panelists, welcome attendees. Um, lovely to see these lovely little initials popping up next to me here, which is, is great to see. Um, so just a quick overview um, before we kick off. These sessions will all be recorded, so if you can't make it on the day, uh, please tell your friends or come back later. Um, they'll be on our website, northerndigifest.co.uk, um, after these a couple of hours after the session. So if you miss it or have to run off, then you can always watch the end. Um, my name's Heather Niven, so I'm the uh, main organiser of the event, but I've been helped enormously by Maggie, who's here as well. Wave, Maggie. So Maggie's been helping with all the social media and is also a co-host on the day. So um, we're both really delighted to, to see you here. So we also have today, uh, we have Dinah Lammerman, um, who has Greek columns behind her. Um, so that's <laughs> Dinah. We have Sarah Coward from In The Room. Um, and she's joined us, and Tim Powell, who's a creative consultant as well, who will be doing um, the sessions this evening on personal, historical and educational digital storytelling. So I'm really looking forward to that. So this, the, the festival is designed to really kind of bring lots of different people together, which from the arts, um, from the creative industries, um, from digital and AI tech, um, and mash them all up, you know, have some interesting conversations with people who maybe wouldn't normally get together um, just to bounce ideas off empower people, enable people to understand digital storytelling better um, and just really generally get their heads around how quickly tech's moving on and how you can use it in um, your creative lives. So, so that's kind of the plan. We're aiming for it to be accessible for everyone. Um, it's free to attend. It's live online in these sessions, but as I say, recorded later. So we've tried to make it um, as accessible as we can. The format is basically where you have an intro to um, our speakers, which I'm doing now. Um, then we'll have three 15-minute presentations um, from our speakers. We'll then follow with a panel discussion and Q&A from you guys. So pay attention uh, because we'll be asking you for your questions towards the end. And I bet you your questions will be much more exciting than mine. So please feel free to uh, put them in the Q&A um, as we go through and we'll pick them up at the end and answer as many as we can. So it's meant to be a relaxing and supportive event. Um, hopefully you're all sitting around in your couches at home and relaxing or wherever you might be. Um, you know, like think of it as a wee chat um, and we really hope that you enjoy it. You learn something um, and take something away from today. Okay, so that's me finished with my intro. Let's introduce the, the panel members who are much more exciting than I am. So let's start with you, Sarah. So Sarah Coward is the founder and CEO of In The Room. And In The Room seeks to transform audience engagement through conversation by enabling audiences and talent to connect with each other. This is achieved through voice interactive conversational media, a powerful tool that integrates voice recognition, AI and authentic audio, audio visual media. With applications in entertainment, healthcare, e-commerce, sport, culture and education, In The Room is transforming communication in multiple global industries. So prior to finding In The Room, Sarah worked at the National Holocaust Centre and Museum, where the Forever Project was born, which is an amazing project. Um, this award-winning work digitally preserves the experience of meeting Holocaust survivors and enables future generations to hear their testimony and to ask questions about their experience. So over to you, Sarah, and I will introduce the other two just before their talks. You should Fantastic. be able to hopefully share your screen. Fantastic. Um, that's great. <laughs> Will do. Thanks so much. And really nice introduction as well. So I appreciate that. And Heather and I sort of worked together in the past as well. So it's, it's been great to sort of see you again. I will do the obligatory moment while I'm sharing my screen. So bear with me for a second. No can you see that okay? You can, yes. Perfect. So that's always a good start. Um, so yes, I'm, as Heather said, I'm Sarah Coward, CEO and co-founder of In The Room, the conversational media company. And it's really good to be able to share some of our work today. I'm going to take a sort of quick canter through the first half, um, really talking about how we've been representing specific, personal, authentic experiences. And then in the second half, bring up some ideas, thoughts that we think are fairly consistent across all of the work we're doing, but also might create um, opportunities for you as well in the audience. So as Heather said, um, 
our work actually started representing the personal experiences of Holocaust survivors. And the reason for that was the National Holocaust Centre and Museum had a significant strategic issue with their education programme because the museum, one of the most powerful things about their education programme for kids was the ability of children to meet a Holocaust survivor, to ask them questions about their experience in the past, either as a survivor or as a refugee to Britain. And through that personal encounter, they would have a much richer understanding of the history that really made an impact on them. Um, so what we created was an interactive location-based experience. This image is actually from some work we also did in, in Germany, um, but it was life-size 3D representation, video representation of the survivor and using conversational AI and voice recognition, the audience and the kids could ask questions to that image and it would respond from a pre-recorded set of authentic testimony recordings. We worked with about 12 survivors altogether, including some of our work in Germany, and the survivors answered between 800 and 1400 questions each, sort of creating a really rich, important repository of their own sort of witness testimony. And uh, as that project developed, it was a location based project originally, but then we thought, you know, if we could actually develop more flexible web based technologies, we could make these types of educational experiences that represented an individual's life and life story available uh, through the web on a scalable basis. So um, our conversational media platform enables people to have a video interface. The user asks questions using their voice or text. The AI matches that question or inquiry to the best answer in the data set. And the talent, the, the, uh, the witness, the individual responds from pre-recorded data, pre-recorded media. And this has enabled, for example, the National Holocaust Centre and Museum, as well as our work with the University of Munich, to create online experiences that deliver scalable, mass scalable encounters for students with these remarkable individuals. So with the National Holocaust Centre and Museum, they now have an online facility in addition to their, their 3D immersive experience at the museum, which enables students to hear witness testimony, to have a conversation or conversational experience, I prefer to call it probably, with those individuals, and also includes a set of learning resources that provides additional and complementary material. Because this is all web-born and web-based, it means that these experiences are available and accessible on mobile devices as well as desktops. And one of the things that we've been able to uncover as a result of, of delivering these sort of personal encounters really is the way in which people respond to as a lot of I'm sure the audience will appreciate a lot of the way audiences respond to immersive interactive media is very very different to how they respond to linear or standard media and the students were really starting to express their excitement and interest about their own learning where they feel they're able to become closer to these individuals, ask questions, engage, um, interact and explore using their own agency and their own initiative. In addition to some of the work that we've done on the ground and the other work we're doing in education, we've also done some interesting research that really starts to uncover how different ages and different populations are starting to engage with this type of material. So as you can see here um, from a survey we did of 400 from predominantly US 18 to 23 year olds, the vast majority were really interested in engaging in these types of tools, interactive tools, um, interactive video tools, et cetera, and audio tools as well, actually, for supporting their learning in a more, in a more sort of richer, engaging way. 
And some of the specific benefits that that research started to draw out, including some research we did with Manchester Metropolitan University, were around the asynchronous learning, the ability for students to access information in a personalised and scalable way at in a time zone that is uh, fits in with their learning late at night, two o'clock in the morning, it doesn't really matter. They feel like they actually have access to those individuals at the drop of a hat. In addition to some of the work that we've done on the more sort of traditional end of personal representations in education, as Heather referenced earlier on in the introduction, we're also seeing uh, edutainment applications where people are using our technology and other technologies to represent individual people's lives. So one of our first web experiences was working with the um, National Portrait Gallery and Universal Music on uh, one to one encounter with Niall Rogers, the US musician and guitarist. And Heather was engaged, was involved in this project. So uh, she might have some things to say about it later. And that really manifested itself in two ways. Firstly, a VR experience. And that provide a really, a re, provided a really sort of visceral uh, one to one encounter where the people who experienced that felt a very strong sense of presence because of the immersion. And that experience also enabled people to ask questions using their voice to Nile and get a response straight away in VR. Our web version of that experience was obviously uh, scalable and launched internationally in 2021. And again, some really different context because it's slightly more sort of fan-based personal representation of Nile, uh, but some really interesting things came through with that. People, for example, saying that they were nervous when they were um, having this encounter with him over the web, even though they know in theory he's, he's not actually there, they know it's a digital experience. But because they were actually able to engage and ask questions to him themselves, it created a different type of dynamic, which was really interesting. So some of the things that we're certainly seeing now as we've developed this work and in this sort of field is the ability for authentic personal encounters to create conversations and interactions that would previously been impossible, but still feel authentic. And just moving on to some of the sort of more thematic pieces now, that's really sort of fueled by three main areas. Firstly, just keeping on the time, I'm halfway through, I'm not doing badly here, Heather, that's okay. Um, that's really fueled by three things. The firstly, the power of parasocial relationships. So just to clarify, when we're talking about parasocial relationships, it's about how broad audiences connect with and feel like they know a well-known figure or um, an expert or a talent. Now, not all of those people have to be really famous, but they're people who are the audience feels like they know them in some way, shape or form. And a lot of organisations from what we've seen aren't necessarily le leveraging the power that they have in, in the talent, in the influencers, in the, um, the witnesses, whoever sort of represents or is engaged in their organisation. There's a lot of, of power that's being left on the table right now um, that people could start to release. Uh, secondly, and fairly obviously, I think, to a certain extent, is this sort of desire for a personalised experience or a personalised relationship that we're seeing coming through across, across both our work and obviously uh, a lot of other organisations work. And um, although in some of the broader work we're doing, for example, working with Holocaust survivors or large life stories like Nile, where you have got a rich amount of content, that ability to create a personalized experience is, is significant. If you've got a, a question set of 800, it's a very, very sort of uh, rich opportunity for a personalized experience. But even with smaller data, data sets and different quantities of media, there's 
a significant opportunity for creating personalised experiences, even with a relatively small group of media. And then thirdly, this sort of appreciation of human experience. So one of the things that I find quite interesting with the title of this conference, and it's something that we'll touch on later during the week, is this sense of what is a story? Um, how do we represent stories? And what are humans? What are human stories? And some of the things that we've found is the individual, the person, the sort of embodied human is obviously different from the story they're telling. And I think from what we've seen, it's really important to remember that those two things are fundamentally different. It might seem obvious, but they're fundamentally different. So the ability of somebody to connect with a story that's been authentically told is fundamentally different from a story that has been told. It's almost like the difference between a piece of art that's been created by the artist themselves and an absolutely perfect replication that the artist didn't touch. And in theory, they could be almost exactly the same. But the quality of the, the individual presence definitely has a, a value and a power that we see coming out in lots of different forms. And it's certainly something that we're really interested in exploring. My laptop's slightly gone to sleep. Hopefully I can move, there we go, move screens. And as part of that, we've been looking at the core reasons why audiences like to connect with specific people. And we've broken that down into three areas. Firstly, people like to connect with a specific person because of what that person knows. So they might be an expert, they might be a leader, they might be a, a product expert, um, it might be something that they sort of have a depth of knowledge, it might be a curator in a museum. So people want to talk to that person because of what they know. Secondly, they also might want to talk to somebody not because of what they know necessarily, but because of who they are. So that's got an element of status and an element of role. So it might be because they're famous. Um, it might be because they're a known politician, it might be because they have sort of standing in some other field, or it might be because they are an expert, but a, a known expert. And thirdly, people like to connect with an individual because of what they have experienced. So what they might have lived through, whether they might be a, a cancer somebody who's, who's li living with cancer they might be somebody who has who's been a witness or it might be something that they have lived through the 60s and they haven't experienced to share and all of these three elements are very distinct so some people and some personal experiences and stories that are being expressed have all of these things sometimes experiences have have just one of these things but it's really really powerful so as we're working with our conversational and non-linear storytelling techniques, but very much focused on the individual per people and personalities, we think about and consider whether the audience is touching on one of these things, and if so, which is the most sort of prominent and important. And we're now seeing this really coming through in a lot of different applications using our technology. So whether that's education, um, what, as I said, we're working with a number of different universities, corporate training providers, um, different educational organizations at the moment, going to be doing a really interesting piece of work with the University of Auckland with members of the Maori community, for example. Entertainment, 
there's some personal representations of well-known figures. So McLaren Formula One um, has just done peace with Mika Hakkinen, Formula Formula One driver from the 1990s. Uh, obviously, a lot of commercial applications representing influencers or people with significant um, knowledge around certain products. And then lastly, we're also seeing some really interesting applications in healthcare. We're going to be doing a pilot associated with the World Health Organization and one of their sort of partners that they've introduced us to, which is about representing the experiences of individuals that have gone through specific health related conditions. That has also been applied in the mental health field as well, as people have been sharing their experiences with depression and other aspects of mental health. A few seconds over, I think, Heather, but hopefully that gives you a good overview of our work and perhaps a few things to consider as well. Thank you. Thank you. That was fascinating. Thank you, Sarah. And I didn't realise you were up to so much stuff, you know, since I saw you last. It's amazing. It's like really interesting, actually. L loads to tell you, actually, Heather. So, yeah. We yeah. need a cup of tea Happy to share that. Oh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> oh, definitely. No, that was really great. Thank you. So hopefully that's given our participants lots and lots of food for thought in terms of questions. I think they've all been um, stunned into silence, though. I'm not seeing many questions coming through yet, but, but we'll, we'll give them time. But thank you for that, Sarah. So I'm going to move swiftly on to, to you, Tim. Uh, I'm going to introduce you next. And then uh, at the end, we'll, we'll have some Q&A. But um, that was great. Thank you. OK, so Tim, you've heard this before, but we'll do it again. <laughs> so Tim's a freelance producer and a creative consultant. And as a producer, he creates award winning experiences that combine immersive technology, live performance and physical installations that delight audiences in venues, in public spaces, at festivals and online. In his consultant role, he helps organisations develop strategies for innovation and approaches to immersive storytelling. He presents and teaches his work internationally. Currently, Tim is a creative entrepreneur in residence at Reading University, and previously he acted as a consulting producer for the Gunpowder Plot, which is a feature length immersive historical experience at the Tower of London, and it received rave reviews from the British media and is developed in partnership between layered reality and historic royal palaces. The gunpowder plot transports audiences deep into 19, uh, 1605 London, not 1965 London, 1605 London as active participants in Britain's most famous plot. So for this, this session today, um, Tim's going to say the gunpowder plot is a feature length immersive experience at the Tower of London, combining walkthrough sets, live actors, ambisonics and virtual reality with a wide range of digital and stage effects. And it's been developed in partnership between layered reality and historic royal palaces and transports audiences deep into 1605 London. Over to you, Tim. Great, thank you. Very good to be back. We had a brilliant session earlier, so looking forward to uh, your questions later as well. So as before, I don't need to um, uh, introduce myself. It's all been done very thoroughly already. And uh, I guess I was thinking how to encapsulate what um, the approach to, to uh, historical storytelling um, that maybe a lot of my work and particularly the gunpowder plot is looking at and it's a shift about rep trying to replicate what things looked like in terms of that kind of sense of authenticity to what they felt like so trying to recreate the feeling of experiencing those things firsthand for audiences rather than necessarily uh, a kind of forensic rebuilding of, of, of the um of the objects and things it's much more focused on the emotion so I, i've just been tired <laughs> For some reason, I haven't got access to this, so I'm going to have to skip the trailer, but um, it probably won't lose too much from that anyway. But um, so the gunpowder plot, yeah, is a, is a feature length experience. So it's um, there you enter the show in groups of up to 16 and one group goes in every 10 minutes. Um, the show is spread over 25,000 square feet of space. Um, in this kind of old subterranean basement underneath the, um, the uh, tower vaults next to the Tower of London. Um, and it's a fully written li li linear narrative. So it's, um, you kind of, uh, everything you experience is part of the same story. It's not kind of different, it's not different kind of periods of history or different stories. It's, you're, you're in it from start to finish. Um, so it's a hundred minutes long, seven consecutive scenes of 10 minutes each. And very importantly, a, 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 an interval bar for you to kind of uh, build some more Dutch courage or what have you. Amongst those seven scenes, there's uh, three in virtual reality, 
one is a projection mapping space and one is an ambisonic um ambisonic uh sound room um, and it's using layered realities uh trademark um combination of traditional theater so sets and performance with immersive technologies like vr and then finally a whole layer of, of atmospheric so using things like temperature and smell and moisture and all of these different wind and all these different things to deepen the immersion of the of the audiences um and the experience itself is is that you are a catholic prisoner in the tower of london and you were released as a spy on condition that you you spied for the crown um this includes things like zip wiring across the thames rowing the gunpowder over the thames with with guy forks hiding for priest hunters in tiny little priest holes um, and there are two audience uh, there are two endings depending on audience choice and uh, as Heather said it's a partnership between layered reality who brought their experience of operating immersive shows like Somni and uh, War of the Worlds um, and historic Royal palaces obviously the Tower of London location uh, historic Royal palaces kind of tourism brand um, and historical expertise as well. That was, that was the kind of foundation of the partnership. And we were, one of the other things layered reality are able to bring is, is a really kind of world-class creative team. So um, that was Tom Felton, uh, Draco Malfoy was, was our kind of lead digital character. So he's cast as Guy Fawkes um, in the show. He's not there every day, but he is digitally every, there every day, every show. Um, directed by Hannah Price, written by Danny Robbins, who did Batsy Poltergeist, um, 222, A Ghost Story, all those sorts of things, and, and a whole host of kind of, of, of leaders from their fields. Um, and we were delighted with lots of lots of press. So the five stars from the Times and kind of four stars from lots of others, and a few sniffier uh, reviews has to be said that I've not included on here. Theatre, theatre press wasn't so wasn't so convinced, but you know, bad humbug. Um, because these these are the ones that really matter. So the the reviews um on Google reviews and TripAdvisor, the what we found is that the traditional press reviews, which you obviously want because it's a great pat on the back, but they don't ship tickets anything like these kind of these kind of actual aud verified audience reviews. Um, it really people seem to rely on word of mouth very strongly for these new types of experience because they're not quite sure what they are necessarily um, straight off the bat. So how we made it. What we wanted to do is quite simply, you know, put the audience, fully immerse the audience into an authentic Jacobean world and give them agency over the story. We wanted world-class theatre standards and I'll come back to exactly what that is uh, or what we meant by it. Um, to marry theatrical excellence with excellent storytelling, so one is never there without being needed by the other, historical accuracy without compromising entertainment, and most importantly, really, if we're honest, a commercially viable production. I think probably um, I just kind of jump over this relatively quickly, but a huge amount of time was spent establishing the partnership. So. At the time when this came in, I was uh, in-house for Historic Royal Palaces of, as head of the R&D studio there. Um, and it took the longest number of years was actually kind of creating the partnership and the, the, the project ideas. Um, and then, you know, much longer period of time than making it, even with COVID in the middle there. And at the time, we had this R&D studio at, at uh, Hampton Court Palace, where we could invite people in for uh, residencies. So sometimes technologists, sometimes performers, um, and we'd give them a particular challenge or um, have invited them in because of a particular area of interest of theirs um, and give them a, a period of, of weeks in there, paid for, um, to, to prototype ideas. Um, and one of those was this VR residency with uh, a Danish company called Macropol, uh, who made a free walk VR show, very, very kind of sketchy, small thing, but that had live performers in the space, which were motion tracked, who appeared as kind of digital characters inside the, the virtual world. Um, and making this prototype enabled us really to um, bring in the executive board and trustees and people like that, the decision makers from within the organization to experience what the potential of this was um, firsthand. And 
that I think looking back was a crucial step because when the when the time came to um, kind of take the, a risk, a certain amount of risk on a partnership, they already had the kind of um, first hand experience of what this was rather than just kind of, um, you know, having board papers and it being described to them. So, um, so yeah, we were ready for partnership by the time, by the time it came along. And one thing that we maybe weren't expecting so much was um, we developed three different storylines uh, with writers to a kind of treatment stage. So not, not fully scripted out, but, but properly plotted. Um, one was around Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII. One was uh, the gunpowder plot. And the, the third was around the peasants' revolt. We had all assumed that it was going to be Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII was the story that was going to be the one that we took forward. It was the kind of the bankable commercial one or what have you. But we really struggled to find a, 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 an immersive model, um, a, a kind of immersive treatment of it where there was a kind of con consistent audience role um, throughout the whole thing. So, and it was actually the gunpowder pot which allowed us to do that through the, the spy narrative. So, you know, the first lesson number one was that your greatest hits don't necessarily transfer into an immersive format. And actually you might have to think a bit laterally about, about what, what stories you focus on. And challenges, there were many. So this was the, the state of the building when we moved in. It's, it's two stories underground. It's a, it's a listed building, yet it has not been occupied for 20 years or so. This is a mummified rat in the bottom there who was a first resident. Um, Enormous challenge with that. I won't go into that because it's not really the focus today, but 300 tons of concrete was step one of the creative process, you know. Um, the second is uh, that we, creatively we didn't start with a blank canvas. You know, the, the business model that unlocked the partnership and unlocked the funding had certain, um, you had a business model attached to it that, that had to throughput a certain number of people. I uh, had to operate for a certain number of hours a day, et cetera. It, we want, it needed to use the, the, the kind of trademark combination of technology of layered reality. We needed to be able to cast some talent to, to ship tickets. Um, and, and also that it, the, the economics of shows like this are such that you can't have a theater length run. It's got to be able to run for lo a lot longer in order to be able to kind of pay back the investment. So these were absolutely fixed. Um, Kind of expectations on the format um, before we started, so um, you know it it wasn't it wasn't a blank canvas by any means. We also wanted to make sure that when we did use technology, so you know as I said, it's a combination of of the seven scenes, four of them, um, well three of them are virtual reality. There's a projection scene, there's a, a ambisonic sound scene all throughout the thing that you are interacting with live with live performers and you're in the kind of fully built 360 set and managing the tech the transitions between that built world and that live performed world and the world of vr has to be managed really carefully because otherwise it could really break that kind of spell the immersion in that world so you know and we set us up the challenge of 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 there always being a kind of narrative reason for, for going into into technology. So when you're when you're rowing over the Thames, you're actually disguised as a plague doctor. So you put a plague doctor's mask on rather than the VR headset, etc. Things like things like this. Um, and as you saw from the pictures, the the the, the kind of setting itself is very um, uh, small and tight and enclosed, and that's great for the spying and the plotting stories but obviously you can't take you can't pretend there's a there's a cityscape in there but that's what you can do with virtual reality you can create a kind of infinite world around them so we take people through Jacobi in London in in the virtual reality and of course you don't have to be uh beholden to reality in in virtual reality so you can all also um create these dream sequences so what you see uh what one of them is Guy Fawkes' vision for the plot so what he wants to happen because of the, but after after the um, the explosion, his vision for a Catholic world, um, and he takes you into his mind um, to see that, which is obviously possible in VR, not in any other way. The story itself, 
is one of great sensitivity that had to be man managed obviously hugely carefully it's uh, uh, at its core it's a story of religiously motivated terrorism um and we also wanted to make sure that um not just telling a story that happened in the past but but making it clear how those events of that time have real direct implications on the world we live in today you know um and, and and this is a is the perfect story that could we you know we we still celebrate it once a year for goodness sake um there's also a challenge with this story which is that most of the audience know the ending which in terms of dramatic uh, tension is not ideal um so the 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 um spy narrative was really was a real kind of revelation when we when we landed on that when the writer landed on that because it allows you to cast the choice of one side or another is pro, pro the plot or anti the plot rather than pro catholic pro protestant um and that and that really kind of enabled us to not not be seen to be taking sides which was which was cru crucial um but we do show the kind of different sides of um uh of guy Fawkes and, and the plotters so on the left there is him in his kind of heroic mode um, the centre there is, is, is th these are these are kind of green screen sh shots that you see in virtual reality. Um, is is that kind of scapegoat? You know, he he wasn't the core plotter of it yet. He's the one we remember because he was definitely scapegoated. And then the third is really him as is he's a terrorist. He's he's plotting a, a kind of act of great violence. So we can we can use the technology and and the combination of live to to showcase all those different aspects. Um, this is our very own branded uh, fake smoke. <laughs> I'm quite proud of this. Um, so obviously, historical palace is expected. Historical accuracy, um, it, you know, it's, it's got a branding on it. It's next to the Tower of London, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so the um, the the ways in which we no, there's a there's a big mismatch between the process of historical research which is a slow analytical um thorough process and the process of, of kind of creative production which is right next week with huge momentum um so the the way the kind of methods we came to overcome that was firstly we had what we called the authenticity statement which actually went in the contract itself um, and that laid out all the different creative parameters like music like costumes like scripts um and it kind of specified the, the degree of um, creative license that could be taken on those. So that allowed the kind of creative team to kind of get on with their jobs rather than checking every micro micro decision back. Um, uh, on top of that, we set up a kind of weekly um, a, a weekly inquiry uh, process where they can ask the curators kind of very very granular questions, and we, we would get the answers within a week. Um, and then the, the third, I get out of jail part maybe is um, is they're, they're they're kind of walking out of the experience. You walk through what we call the corridor of truth, which uh, corrects some of the liberties that have been taken and explains some of the history behind what the, you know, the experiences they've seen. And as very often with the past, the, the truth is actually much more strange than any fiction you can come up with. So they're very surprised by some of the things. Um, some of the things that uh, that were true and some maybe less so that weren't. So as you'll see, the the, the, the left is is a real prisoner cell at the Tower of London, and, and right is 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 our cell in in the show. So as you can see, they they took great pains to to be fully accurate and kind of take all those um, all that source material as in, inspiration. This is graffiti that was carved by prisoners in the tower itself, and this is our kind of recreation of it in the in the show. And what we did find actually is that sometimes, um, you know, it, it would be, you wouldn't believe me if I pretended it was all completely harmonious all the way through the entire process, but sometimes, um, you know, the, 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 the fear of creative teams is that, is that, is that maybe curators would, would, are gonna be too um, inflexible and all the rest of it. But sometimes we found that, that history actually solves some creative problems. So um, as I mentioned, you zip wire across the Thames we needed to get the audience across from one side of the Thames to the other as part of the as part of the story. Um, 
and the curators were able to tell us about Father John Gerard, who was a priest imprisoned at the Tower of London, who actually escaped out of the window of the tower on a rope, strung out the window and, and climbed over the moat on a rope. So we just extended the rope a little longer and had a zip wire over the Thames. So, but it was that it was actually that true piece of history that um that got us out of uh, a creative challenge. Um I've got a few minutes, a few minutes more coming to the end, I promise. Um the I mentioned what we what we kind of refer to as world class um, uh, performance. Personally, I feel that some sometimes immersive is let down by the fact that you only ever encounter one performer, so it's always monologue. Um, kind of you're spoken at, um, whereas you know having more than one character in in a scene allows kind of dialogue and that kind of emotional. Well, you know, it becomes theatre rather than rather than something else. And also having characters that uh, recur, come back, um, you meet multiple times through the experience, so you're able to build that, that emotional connection with them. But if you had a whole cast of characters for every group going in every 10 minutes, you'd have a cast the size of the West End. Um, so we had to make, be able to make a way to um, allow the, the performers to be the same character for multiple different groups. So we have this horrendously complicated show control system that um, back of house gives all of the actors all the information they need um, because this is a kind of floor plan of, of one of the three floors of the show. Um, each of the scenes is essentially operating like its own mini theatre. Um, it's got its own sound and effects and, and all those things that are, that are, that are pre-programmed in. But you also need the flexibility of a group where someone is much slower than, some, than other groups so you have to combine that kind of on rails pre this with the ability to kind of only move people onto the next scene when, when the time is right, when people of the preceding group are out. So it's a combination of manual triggers by the performers um, and, and these yeah, preset kind of show controls. But, but uh, the, the show system gives all of that information to the actors back of house so that they always have the confidence that they're going into the right scene with the right group. Um, and it also records bits of information like um, names of certain people in the group and if they're a chatty group or a quiet group or all the rest of it, so it can really enhance their, their performance. And um, just to, to finish up then, it's uh, the core difference between immersive storytelling, I mean, <laughs> I spoke a lot about this this morning, but um, you know, the audience needs to have a, a believable role in that story world, and that role needs to be consistent throughout the whole experience. Um, so, as I said, we 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 cast the audience as, as Catholic spies, um, and in fact, they're told that they're Catholic spies twelve times in the first fifteen minutes, and even then, even then, sometimes it's not entirely clear to people. Um, but that that kind of uh, casting them as that core role allows us to do one thing, which is just as they enter the interval bar, they're asked as a group to decide whether they stay with the crown and bring back the secrets of the plotters or whether they change sides to support the plotters. And they have to decide this as a, as a group um, in their role as, as spies. Um, and it's, it's really fascinating, firstly, how groups of strangers all kind of enter into this debate and really talk about the subject matter um, that, that they've been presented, but but also how split the the, the, side, the sides are. Um, it's pretty pretty. It's probably a bit of, a bit of a pro plot um, bias or you know the overall average. Um, but dramatically, it's it's a great device because it allows us. You know, ultimately, this is a show about whether there is ever a cause that justified violence, um, and it allows us to kind of directly engage the audience in that central dramatic question of, of the piece. So just to finish then, and the, the question always about historical storytelling is, is authenticity. And I started by saying about actually what, what would an authenticity of feeling um, be like? Because we're all, authenticity is, is both a very subjective thing. Um, we, we hear a lot about our authentic selves now um, and it being the sense of it being true to me and me alone. 
And there's always also an objective meaning, you know, authentic being, you know, based on the best possible evidence set. And there's, there's an inherent tension between those, those two things, I think. So um, my, my kind of proposal would be that actually we're talking about uh, authenticity of experience. So we're recasting the past in a way that allows contemporary audiences to have the same experience or feeling that those historical audiences or the historic characters or, you know, real people who were there would have had them. Um, and ultimately, the, the, the goal here can be creating a memory of the past. You use all of the all of the senses um, and kind of strategies of immersion to, to fix those things to make people feel like they've experienced that. So um, ultimately, what we want to do is it's is a process of recreating the past in our audience's minds using their imaginations and, and creating memories. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim, that was amazing. Um, and I remember you saying that earlier as well, you know, around that authenticity and the fact that people who had gone through the gunpowder plot experience were talking about it as if they had been there and they were talking about. And so it's really interesting that, and, and also that's been echoed as well, in, Sarah, in terms of what you've been talking about as well. So maybe we'll have a bit more of a chat about that in a, in a short while. But uh, that was really interesting. Thank you. Diana, you're up next. <laughs> Okay, so Diana is a professor of immersive factual storytelling in UCL anthropology. Uh, she created and now leads the first Russell Group MA course in immersive storytelling in the UK and launched as a, it launched as a standalone MA in 2022. Since 2017, the Immersive Studio annual cohort has comprised around 30 students, many of whom have gone on to senior positions in the VR and AR industry. She's also co-founder of immersive storytelling company Passporte. Is that the right way of saying it, Dinah? Passport. You can say it any way you like. Passport. Heather, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and it creates stunning and thought-provoking installations that bring to life historical stories for national and international attractions. Clients include the Eden Project, the Tower of London. These guys are quite innovative, actually, aren't they? <laughs> um, Hampden Court, uh, Palace, the National Trust for Scotland and SS Great Britain. And from 2017 to 2019, Dino was part of the BBC VR incubation project that produced and distributed award winning VR content, particularly noted for its compelling narratives and popular appeal. She also led the wide scale project to push VR out over 170 public libraries around the UK, introducing a large new audience to VR and its possibilities. So tonight, Diana is going to talk about how might immersive approaches change our understanding of history, education and our own personal stories and drawing on theory and practice. She'll explore current experiential storytelling examples and how these might shape us in the future. Over to you, Diana. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much, Heather, and thanks to, to Sarah and Tim. Really fascinating to hear about your work. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have been to the Gun the Powder Plot. I have lived it. I have enjoyed it, experienced it, absolutely loved it. I highly recommend it. So if you're in the area, I really suggest you go and find it. It's fantastic. So today um, we're going to talk about um, what I'm going to talk about how um, immersive approaches uh, might change our understanding of history and education and our own personal stories. And I'll be picking up, I think, from some of the points that um, both Sarah and Tim have been making. Um, I guess in my role at UCL, but also at Passport, I kind of wear both hats, the theoretical bit and the practical. So I'm gonna try and draw on that um, to explore some of this. But just before we dive in, I just wanted to pause and think about the terminology. Immersive, it's a very heavily used term. Some might say overused. Um, experiential is another description that helps distinguish this category of, of storytelling. I guess where once we were in the information age, some commentators say we're now in the experiential age. The defining element for immersive or experiential story for me is that it's all around you, you're in the middle of it. But as Tim touched on, as importantly, you're moving into an instinctual mode where thought has, in some part at least, given way to emotions and sensations. Now we know immersion is nothing new. Great books, films, artworks have been transporting us, offering us a way to transcend our habits and our daily lives for centuries. So what is it that distinguishes this new kind of immersive storytelling? That's what I'd like to explore over the next few minutes, drawing on theory and current practice, 
and considering how these ideas might shape our future. So let's start with history. At Passport, as Heather's touched on a little bit, for the last 13 years, we've been pitching people into scenes and stories through immersive games, audio projection mapping. Um, clients included National Trust, Royal Collection, Historic Royal Palaces. There's a bit of a theme developing here today, I feel. Um, the BBC. We brought to life Shackleton's expedition on the endurance of the Fram Museum in, in Norway and conceived immersive helms containing 3D soundscapes, so helmets with 3D soundscapes in store for Cadu in Wales. So we design immersive story, immersive story experiences that take the audience right into the middle of history with a bit of fun and perhaps a little bit of learning. Of course, many museums strive to pitch you into another time and a place, put you into history, but add to the mix some cleverly designed tricks and illusions that surprise and delight either using digital tech or not, and you can heighten the experience, creating an impactful, memorable moment, which, as is important for museums, is one that you want to do again. For instance, at the end of last year, we created the immersive Halloween experiences at Hampton Court Palace and the Tower of London. I know that workshop room in the Hampton Court Palace that you showed an image of, Tim, very well. Um, we produced 17 stories across both sites, immersive rooms that use projection mapping and spatially positioned audio based on the real stories, which of course includes many sensitivities and many challenges of Cardinal Wolsey, Everard Digby, the Duke of Clarence, Henry VI, to name a few, and William III, who, as you will know, as you will all know, <laughs> your historic knowledge is probably far better than mine, died horrifically after a mole scared his horse. This is a little bit of the content. I thought I'd just give you a little taste of it, so hopefully you can hear and see this. Can you hear that? featuring the infamous mole. Oh, let's just not do that again. You don't want to see that again. <laughs> so, but we're not solely interested in digital tech. Um, we want to create illusions in the audience's mind that mean for a brief time, they, they sense that they've stepped into another time or place and experienced history directly. So sometimes we use digital tech, but we're just as happy with a, a down and dirty approach we use whatever tools or kit are the most effective at teasing and tricking the brain. <laughs> Look away, anyone with sensitive nature? Yeah. to have a, a habit of doing that. Uh, so we're essentially creating spatial stories, placing story content all around the audience, indoor and outdoor. So it is a bit like immersive theatre, but we're not relying on, on live action. Sometimes we use lights, images and audio, sometimes just audio. But this spatial approach to storytelling, we believe, and our clients agree, leads to a more direct experience and in turn impact and memorability. It takes, we think, the traditional museum-based opportunity for immersion to a new level. 
And experimenting with this concept of spatial storytelling has helped us understand better why and how audiences find this kind of content compelling because it's happening to them in their 3D space, the world they're used to interacting with, but augmented with a few tricks and a bit of magic. If it's good, it's intuitive and well-designed, they're physically engaged with it. They're not just hearing, they're listening, not just seeing, but watching. They're leaning forward into the experience rather than sitting back. And that seems to be what gives it its memorability. Social media aside, We'll come back to that. We already experience our own personal stories in the 3D world around us. Virtual reality, by which I mean 360 films or fully interactive experiences viewed through a head-mounted display, offers full immersion into a new 3D world. But it's still a familiar concept, an environment that's all around us, which has similarities to the one we operate in every day, which might be one of the reasons that older age groups also seem to be find VR more inclusive than other forms of digital technology. So if immersion and spatial storytelling can take us to a new level, then perhaps these experiential based stories can change the way we understand our own narratives, the stories we tell ourselves. Much pushed originally as a tool for empathy, more and more VR is being explored as a tool that can provide positive experiences that can help users understand themselves better. The researchers are looking at how we might bring together art, technology and psychology to create applications like self-help tools for teenagers suffering anxiety, self-guided meditation and other wellness apps. At UCL, researchers are looking at how VR can be used to help us age playfully. This 3D style thinking in combination with immersive technology will also impact how we organize our memories in the future. I think someone might have got there before me and is making quite a lot of money out of this idea. <laughs> On social media for now, we may interact with personal memories and moments in 2D, but take that into 3D and it starts to get interesting. While we know that for now, the friction points with VR headsets are significant, whether you like them or not, with the level of investment that Meta is thinking into this technology, solutions to the hardware issues seem likely to be coming down the line very soon. I'm not advocating we all create our avatars and jump into VR chat rooms, unless that's your thing, but imagine if you put on a headset and relive special times with special people who might not be around anymore, come face to face with your loved who could no longer live in the real world, but continue to exist in the digital virtual space. I'm sure you, like me, treasure those little bits of media of family or friends who've died, whether it's a voicemail message or a bit of video, they might allow us to stay connected with them even after their death. You could visit birthday parties in the, pa in the past. You could re-experience your wedding again and again. You could even travel back to before you were born and interact with yourself in the womb. Or go back into history and meet your ancestors in some kind of 3D gallery enhanced by audio, images and other media. Your own 3D media, which you can step into and relive. Perhaps people in the future will look back at the 20th and 21st centuries and wonder why we ever interacted with a flat screen, a TV, a computer, a whiteboard. We experience the world in 3D and this technology allows us to extend our 3D experience into new spheres. And applying experiential or immersive tools to how we learn and how we teach others was the obvious and probably powerful next step. VR has the potential to reroute neural pathways to change our understanding of ourselves, but also the way we think and our behavior. It's a big claim, I know, but there's a lot of research out there coming up with the evidence to show that it's, it's the case. As part of the BBC VR incubation project, we wanted to test if and for whom immersive storytelling could be a successful tool to impart information. So to do that, we took VR content and headsets into 175 libraries around the UK in 2019. 
It was, it was all right, Chuck. Gorillas were coming in my direction. <laughs> The users experienced a visceral sense of the story of the Congo. That's another one as well. That's the silverback. It felt really real. It felt like the second you put the headset on, you felt like you were really there. And we were in a helicopter and you looked down and you started to get that same feeling as you get when you're looking on a real height. Like you're looking down and you start to sort of feel like that because it feels like it's really real. I enjoyed being immersed in a different country. Um, somewhere I'd never go to normally um, and seeing people sort of um, talking to me directly and, and just being able to look around the environment, look all around and feel as if I was in that actual place. I was kidnapped by these men and they were like all right up in my face and I kept going like that to try and like push them away and then obviously they weren't really there so they didn't respond to me and I was just going like that and they were coming nearer and nearer. But what we found is that people using this, um, these stories, they didn't retain the facts that we delivered in the traditional journalistic methods in the audio narration or in the text. Their connection with the material... body experience, I think. <laughs> Their connection with the material, though, did generate some curiosity that then drove them to want to find out some more. Delivering information in a spatial way, integrating it into the world itself, is being recognised as an effective learning tool. VR as a visualisation aid can help an understanding of abstract concepts. It's also a tool for data visualisation and as such has the potential to provide a more inclusive route to learning. VR for education is already established in many areas and examples are growing in number and across more fields, from training to role play, accessing difficult environments, or even perfecting surgery techniques in the virtual world, rehearsing them before applying them to the real world. In virtual reality, learners are placed in an immersive environment where they can interact with their surroundings. And so this leads to more realistic learning experiences and creates more neural pathways in the brain. In other words, for some skills at least, VR helps us learn better and remember more information. And the academics seem to agree. For instance, this quote is from the JMIR medical journal published in 2022. Immersive VR modalities not only offer a realistic experience to the user, but they also have the additional benefit of spatial understanding. The higher level of immersion, the greater the spatial understanding, which can result in greater effectiveness scientific visualization. At UCL, the cardiovascular surgeons have integrated VR into their teaching, as has UCL School of Pharmacy, which is taking its digital twin labs out to schools and using them instead of lecture theatres to teach with impressive results. But it's not just in virtual reality that we can take advantage of our propensity for learning better in 3D. A spatial and experiential approach outside of a headset could also improve learning. It's to do with the way our brain works. We remember better in 3D, which those of you who've experimented with memory techniques like memory palaces will know. At Passport, we've started to put this to the test. We're working on projects to use spatial storytelling outside of a virtual reality headset as an educational tool. With Oxford University, we recently created a mobile escape room to teach concepts of new... Warning, the laboratory has been shut down. All personnel evacuated. AI intelligence is malfunctioning and hostile. In one hour, there will be a full containment breach. The outcome of this for everyone is dying. this space will be sharing the results of that project in the coming year. But to conclude, so we posed this question at the beginning, will immersive approaches change our understanding of history, education, and our personal stories? They have already and continue to do so. 
whether that's enjoying being saturated in color, immersed in a Van Gogh painting, or visiting new worlds without leaving your classroom, living room, or care home. In every field we can imagine, immersive, experiential, and spatial storytelling about ourselves and the world around us is changing the way we see ourselves and has the potential to improve the way we live and think in the future. Amazing. I feel actually physically excited by that, you know, it's like, and a bit scared, you know, but it's, it's incredible just how quickly the technology is moving on and, and just the, 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 the impact of that on humanity, you know, really is amazing. Um, which would lead me on to my first question, which I isn't scripted, sorry guys. <laughs> but in terms of this, um, is it the emotional impact of it? Is it the agitation and the headset and the escape rooms? Is it is it the linking of the emotion to the in the brain that helps you be create something that's more memorable um, than if you were just doing it independently? And and if that it two questions. And if that is the case. Um, are people going to become desensitized to that as they get used to that immerse, more immersive experience than, than the moment where it's all new and exciting? Anyone can answer. Shall I, shall I pitch, pick up? Do, yeah, pitch in. I mean, my, my view is, um, yes, it's definitely that. It's definitely like you connect to the emotions. We, we sometimes talk about audio, spatial audio, as being hardwired to the imagination. And it kind of seems to bypass the cognitive bit of your brain and directly connect to the emotion. And I'm sure the others will want to say something on that as well, but just to um, say on your second point about the sense, are we gonna become desensitized? There's always the way, it's always gonna be a novel thing the first time you do it, but like any media, as it matures, you know, we get better at doing it. So it's kind of like, you know, do we, are films less impactful now than they were when they were first created? Well, no, they're just, they're just, better maybe i mean it might be controversial thing to say but you know we get better at the tools and understanding how to do it so i, d I don't think that, um that's going to be the case but i'd be really interested to hear the other the other views go on sarah yeah I, I think um i think one of the things i love about these types of presentations and it was great hearing tim and dinah's brilliant um examples is that i think sometimes people think that all of these problems are technical problems but a lot of the time it's about you know all of the humanity that everybody was talking about here that's what it's about really it's about using as Dinah's Dinah was saying using the tools but if you just think about these things as being technical problems or what you can do because you've got the tool you miss the whole power and point of doing these things which are about um visceral responses and emotions and um humans are animals and we will always react to environmental stimulus as creatures and as animals to a certain extent and living living bodies so um i think remembering that reminds us of the power of some of these things to create those responses mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're on mute tim Yes, I don't don't want to repeat everything I said this morning because we did talk a bit about this quite, quite a lot. But you know, if, if you use multi sensory stuff, if you've got smells and scents and haptics and you know whatever combination of things, you are this is in a you know you are basically modelling the real world for people. That's exactly how our brains model the real world. We take all of the sensory data and we turn it into a, a model that combines all of those uh, kind of experiences and emotions that are connected to those types of experience with us with us before. So it, it can feel like kind of sensory, just kind of, you know, a bag of tricks being thrown at people, but it's actually much closer to real life. Um, and, and, and I think looking back at some of the, uh, you know, the early um, uh, kind of experiences, you know, the, the problem with VR is, is, is in terms of buying a headset that you have at home, most of the stuff on there is crap, really bad. And most of it's um, is cheap, is cheap thrills, it's, it's jump scares, it's zombies, it's really, and it's, it, it makes me really sad because it's a, it's a real kind of um, limited version, limited ambition for what this stuff can, can, act, can actually do. But um, so no, I think, I think it's been misused as a, as a kind of thrill simulator where it, it can actually be, 
yeah, not it, it's not the empathy machine that when maybe people thought it was, but it is something like a memory making machine. I'm going to ask a controversial question then. Is is that because of the people making the things on the VR headsets, and do we need to have a more diverse group of people making the the experiences on there in the first place? Maybe people that have a little bit more empathy, perhaps. It's just, I, I think it's just economies of scale at the moment. Like, you know, the, the, the cost of creating stuff versus the actual audience is, you know, it's much more viable business-wise to have an in-location VR experience and actually expect people to come, come to you because, you know, you can encourage secondary spend, but you can also have far more um, elaborate tech systems because you've got, you know, you've got technicians and people man maintaining it. Um, the, the market for, for at-home VR experiences is still so small that there's no real kind of investment in, um, it's, it's nice to see that like, people like Pilot Theatre earlier and um, Anagram are, are creating really, really quality, quality stuff that is available on these, on these um, kind of at-home platforms now, but it felt like, I mean, Sarah and Dinah, you'll feel this too, I'm sure that, that the best VR experiences were seen by about 50 people in the industry who just went round to all of the festivals and saw them, that literally no members of public were there, you know? <laughs> and it was, so it's, yeah, there's great stuff being made, but it's not it's a mis massive mismatch to the at-home kit that people have. Although that, that was kind of the, the reason for doing the library project was to try and get it out to, to the public. But I mean, I think just to pick up on what you're saying, Tim, I think the other thing is that so far content has it's not been understood that content has to be good the assumption was that you just put the headset on and that's going to be enough and actually that's just so not the case you know i mean there's some fantastic content um vr games you know very very well established but as you try to sort of cross fertilize or cross over into a slightly new place at the moment the text being the driver rather than understanding that being able to create good immersive stories is absolutely fundamental to it you know as sarah said that that is the point is that you know you have to understand the psychology the neuroscience the you know the how people interact with with, with stories and and in this this particular medium otherwise um you know you, you're just going to create rubbish content as as, as Tim said and it's interesting you saying that because when i worked with sarah on the um the nile rogers project about... the, the amount of preparation and, and mm. psychology and, and research all even to the how many centimeters away from the viewer mm. is the is the the actor is the talent going to be and the whole onboarding process and the whole kind of switching between the vr space and the the actual space you know there's so much in there in there that's really you know in depth and psychological yeah and there's one thing i wanted to mention on that actually as well in terms of um um i think tim was talking about yeah the jump scare the 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 i think sometimes there is a a pressure to try and do too much sometimes in in vr and i remember when we were planning the the vr experience with nile rogers we were looking at a number of different vr experiences where people were represented in in the space and quite a few of them were actually we we felt were doing too much in that um if you're if you're developing a story and telling a story and you've got a lot of things that you need to convey that's one thing but what we were trying to do is create a really deep sense of presence and keep the focus on the person who was sitting opposite you who you were going to be speaking with and asking questions to and so having distractions around it in the environment by creating a really complicated environment that people wanted to look around really wasn't we realized wasn't the point because if you created when we're speaking to each other as one-to-one -one opposite each other the last thing you do is start looking around because it's really rude <laughs> if you're not paying attention so I think um I think as Dinah was saying as well there's the sense of you know what are you trying to do what you what feeling are you trying to create and really honing uh, focusing in on that mm -hmm. in order to create something meaningful even little just little daft things like if you think about numbers you look in a certain direction if you think about spatial you look in a different so if you're involving in that kind of two-way conversation mm. in a VR headset that person that, that that VR person has to be able to behave like that or you hit the uncanny valley and everything feels a bit weird you know 
So I, I'm just conscious that we've got quite a few questions coming through and I'd like to give people time to, to have their questions answered. So Adam Gill, um, he's really fascinating projects, but he's wondering if there are any suggestions um, and how someone might approach creating an interactive and immersive experience on a budget, which might help with this democratization of um, VR content, um, but how, how people can do it that don't have massive budgets. Does anyone get any suggestions? Yeah, but I would say the starting point is don't necessarily think visually. There's there's a lots of there's sound is sound and smell and all those other things can create immensely rich and powerful and emotional worlds. It, and it, it's, as soon as you put visuals on stuff, it's, it's, it becomes the most it becomes the most expensive. So you know, spatial audio stuff is is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and relatively just relatively cheap. Sorry, Diana. No, just 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 to tag onto that, and relatively cheap, you know, the software, and you know, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and ditto. I think there's so many opportunities to have um, cost-effective interactive experiences that uh, it's sort of a part of a spectrum, really. So, um, I, I I genuinely think now there aren't barriers to small medium businesses, small museums, small cultural organisations. Um, moving from doing something you know creating something that is quite powerful and immersive without big budgets mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and it, particularly as you said sarah keeping it simple and you know not overloading it you never you, you know less is more always in this space yeah you know ultimately a great immersive experience is one where you you feel that you you had your presence in the world had real meaning that you had a kind of you were, you were able to do something consistently and, and you never kind of hit the walls and reached you know the points where you couldn't you know where, where you couldn't control things anymore so it's just really thinking through that experience and if you deliver something that, that was you know previously impossible however you know big or small or large or, or whatever it is it's going to be a great experience but i think sometimes people tend to put like throw all the money at one moment that was really flashy and then the rest is just an anti-climax but actually if you just spread it out and make that actual kind of audience journey that kind of their story in the story world then but yeah you can't go wrong really well you can <laughs> <laughs> nice chance of it. <laughs> brilliant okay i've got lots of questions from robbie so i'm going to consolidate a couple if that's okay robbie um so he's asking about when you create these experiences what challenges do you have keeping your audience engaged in the story which we've touched on a little bit but maybe maybe we could start with that one i'll consolidate the next two how do you keep people engaged? Well, I think it's exactly what Tim was just saying about you know understanding your your user journey so that you're you've you've mapped and designed your experience to un to understand or to to try and predict where you want the audience to feel something, mm -hmm. and so you know you've created moments within that story that 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 hit that and and you, obviously you you're going to test that in you know extensively and you're user testing it. it, it, it the various stages in the production process and reiterate and reiterate in order to fine tune that mm -hmm. um that that those moments to mean that they actually produce that emotional impact and you know using the quite traditional methods in many ways of creating that kind of arc where the tension is building it releases a bit and the new tension builds and then you get some kind of resolution you know i mean i think the gunpowder plot is a great example of how it's designed to create those emotional moments where you connect in a different way in multiple times and it builds that tension mm -hmm. i think it's really interesting as well um that's why i love being panel groups of people that are doing quite different things a lot of complementary work but also quite different so um we just talking there about the, these intense moments and experiences which have a a, a really powerful story arc that you're taking people from one moment and you're taking through an experience towards an end mm -hmm. um and one of the things that what we do is it's quite different from that because it's very that the audience experiences things one-to-one -one in their own time so they might not have those moments of sort of curated beautiful sort of peaks and troughs um but there's a slightly different dynamic in that you they can experience something over the engagement issue is different they can engage over an extended period of time so the challenges around that are different rather than keeping those peaks and troughs in a certain moment you can encourage them to revisit the depth of material so with Nile Rogers with the web experience we got 
we're touching base with people on a sort of weekly basis saying oh have you explored songwriting or did you ask Niall about speaking to David Bowie or that sort of thing so people's experience actually went on for sort of months because you were just encouraging them to sort of dip back into the conversation have a bit more time with him which is quite different from a sort of intense period of um, emotional ups and downs if you see what I mean they're just different types of approaches I think which digital technologies enable you to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Now, Sheree Murphy has touched on something which is actually really interesting and might open a massive can of worms. So if it does, I'm apologies to everyone else for their questions. Um, so um, Sheree talks about the accessibility of VR is boundless, but what are your thoughts regarding the ethics of the VR experience? Who decides what is the truth, particularly to retelling history? And will there be a process for accountability to the author of the VR experience? Now, just to add to her question, this has got massive impact in terms of AI and things like chat GPT as well. You know, who is accountable um, and, and where is the responsibility for the truth? Not a little question like, but <laughs> we've got about <laughs> nine minutes. <laughs> I'm just, just a quick comment on, um, I mean, just briefly on the ethics. I think it's something that from an organisational point of view, um, anybody in my opinion, particularly on the historical pieces, um, everyone, every organisation has obviously got to think about that really carefully. Uh, we did quite a lot of work around, for example, witness testimony, authenticity, uh, trust, etc. Um, and, you know, there are challenges around that that you need to take an ethical written approach for. Um, but one of the things I think we found is extremely important is particularly those sort of witness historical testimony pieces is having as we called it as a pot you know a poly polyvocality approach where you're taking a number of different voices talking about the same type of experience or connecting with a certain historical event so you're not presenting one single perspective as the the truth but you are um representing different people's experiences over a period of time yeah i mean absolutely we we the simple answer is, it is you just don't take it lightly at all, at all, at all. It's um, it was the most painful part of the creative process about kind of playing out how every how, how all of these implications would be, or how all of these kind of um, scripting choices or whatever would be interpreted by by audiences. And it's just a, it's a really forensic um, process of making sure you've got both sides represented. Um, making sure that they're represented not just as number of words on a page or whatever, but also as the kind of intensity of the experience in which they are. Um, mm. But it's, um, yeah, and, and as I mentioned, the get out of jail card is the, the corridor of truth at the end. I think, I think audiences aren't, they're not naive about dramatic license and stuff. They do understand mm -hmm. that, that, that there is a need to, to dramatize things, mm -hmm. but it's, as long as people feel, as long as you're honest about it and don't fool mm. people, I think there's a lot of tolerance, tolerance and understanding for it. And also, you know, ultimately, any any historical thing that didn't in some way reference the fact that, you know, that what it, you know, what if there isn't a true event of it. It's all about who who won, who wrote it, who you know. All, it's the, it's literally the thing of history, isn't it? About reinterpreting and rearguing and all of that. So. Be yeah, the, 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 the realization that history hasn't got any facts in it is always a shocking one, isn't it? You think, oh, okay. What we found <laughs> but I think, you know, just to pick up Tim's point, I think it is, it's really important to take it incredibly seriously. But, and I think it's, there has to be this element of transparency with the audience. Um, so, yes, approach it with, with sort of journalistic integrity, but also making the audience aware that, you know, actually this time we've, we've, we've taken it as inspiration and it's turned into something a little bit more we fictionalized or, or, or you know kind of introduced an element of what if into it but as long as you're totally honest with the audience and you're transparent um that is that's a really helpful way of of of, of your user your audience your views or whatever you want to call them um coming along with you and understanding the context in which that story is being told and who's telling it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love the concept of the corridor of truth and that's echoed by Jude Murphy in the questions and answers section as well just saying it's a really great kind of um sort of uh, idea that, that that balances a richly engaging experience with a more objective history um and i think you know having that debrief zone um where you can kind of clarify which bits were fiction and which bits might have more sort of embeddedness in the truth is actually a great way of offboarding people at the end of that that experience 
Mm -hmm. So I'm just a little comment as well in terms of your WHO um, stuff and your work in mental health and that sense of, again, there's a sense of responsibility there, but almost uh, with people with mental health issues, um, having that, you know, being able to talk to something that isn't going to be affected by the emotion, you know, and wondering around that in terms of that that, that sense of otherworldliness in VR um, and, and with mental health issues and there seems to be that it just I, I got really excited when you both talked about that in terms of the the, the possibilities there for, for the future really there's something mm -hmm. really quite amazing there actually. it's coming quite up, up quite a lot in terms of the benefits around safe spaces and mm -hmm. um, so the piece of work we're doing in New Zealand or they're doing uh, and looking at Maori community Sort of representing and talking about different aspects of the community one of the aspects of those sorts of projects is the ability for audiences to ask anonymous questions so you don't have to feel embarrassed or you don't feel like it's a stupid question that I really should know the answer to but I just don't mm -hmm. um, so providing that safe space aspect is is coming up a lot mm -hmm. across a number of different applications which I find really interesting mm -hmm. absolutely I'm sorry, Robbie, you've got three questions left, but it's it's only a few minutes to the end. So I can probably I could probably ask one and then um, I'll have to sort of wind up and say thank you to everyone. So so one one more question for Robbie. Um, what restrictions, if any, did presenting a factual history event or a situation have on the story you told? I didn't say that very well. What restrictions, yes. if any, did presenting a factual historical event or situation have on the story you told? Yeah, I, I'll do a quick answer for this, actually, that, that um, sometimes when you are working with kind of theatre or writers who are used to working in fiction, they have this um, initial kind of like pushback against the fact that it's, there's, you know, there's, there's kind of requirements and then all the rest of it. And then I've had this a few times where the kind of penny drops that all the hard work's already done because it happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And you've actually got a narrative arc already so the challenge can be um putting a really interesting spin or lens on something that already happened but the basic job of of plotting something out is done mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's actually quite quite liberating you can you can just experiment on top of something that is already works as a story mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. i'd say the one the, the one of the trickiest things we found is that actually sometimes the real story was too horrific to be told so we were having to tone down, but still keep that same element of, you know, excitement or um, or shock, even actually in some cases. But but maybe just stopping short of the the real experience because yeah, it, it, the client was concerned about terrifying people. The very fact that you say that after having like a power drill gone into somebody's wax hand with blood flying <laughs> out of it, and that's you toning it down, worries me quite a lot. You know. <laughs> It were just a wax work. I okay, have to remember that for Halloween, lovely. actually. That, that, that technique, I was sitting making notes. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> I will wind up. So thank you so much. That was a really exciting and interesting session. Um, absolutely fascinating stuff. I feel really physically excited afterwards. So thank you for that. Um, special thanks to Dinah and to Sarah and to Tim. We absolutely need a cup of tea and a bun at some point soon to have a catch up. Um, thanks again, Maggie, for being my rock on the side in case everything broke. Um, I forgot to mention our sponsor, Sign, the Screen Industries Growth Net Network. Thank you very much for sponsoring us or we couldn't have done this um, or the rest of the festival. So a big, a big shout out to you guys as well. And thank you to our attendees um, for your questions and your input um, and for being around and, and enjoying the session with us as well. So we're back again tomorrow at 12 for our next lunchtime session, which is storytelling for good and evil. Um, and we're going to have some really interesting people. We'll have Bright White, who Sarah knows. We'll have Bright Black, who we didn't know until um, later on last year. And we've also got Kev Curran again from Inspired Root Youth, who we had earlier today. So that should be a really excellent session in the morning. And then we have another session in the afternoon, but um, I've run out of time now, so I'm going to stop. So thank you very much for, um, for, for your participation tonight. Really, really appreciate that. And for anyone else, if you missed it, northerndigifest.co.uk and all the sessions will be there afterwards. So that's me. I'm all done. Thank you very much. And we'll talk to you guys Thank soon. You. Thanks, Heather. Cheers. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.